Zappo online uh, polit uh, political education series uh, this this afternoon or this evening uh, I've I've got the the privilege and honor uh, to be hosting uh, a man that really needs no introduction uh, to the circles of, of activists but particularly uh, in the circles of, uh, of the church and the struggles of our people, particularly the struggles of, of the black working class in this country. Uh, let me introduce someone that is known with a nickname, and maybe you will talk about it in this lecture, uh, someone that is known as Sasso. And uh, this is the distinguished uh, comrade, elder and stalwart, of the Black Consciousness Movement, who is going to present to us a lecture on Reverend Sabelo, son of man, Ntwasa. This is a memorial lecture that he's presenting to us. Like I said, he is Sasso, and uh, he is uh, no one other than Bishop Dr. Joe Sioka. He, just out of interest, let me just share this with you viewers throughout the, the globe. Uh, he was one of, or he's one of the first, he's actually the first black bishop in the then apartheid capital known as Pretoria, uh, renamed as Tswani. Uh, he had quite an interesting stint. He is the former deputy president of, of Azapo. He was deputizing to President Ishmael Mkabela of Azapo. He has been pivotal in the struggle of, of workers as a man of the cloth. Uh, through the years with the late uh, Litsatsi Musala, they formed and established uh, uh, various trade unions of the workers, uh, Bifau, Bamku, and uh, he has been, his trajectory of struggle has been that of identifying with the downtrodden. Let me introduce to you uh, Let me introduce to you uh, Bishop Dr. Jose Oka. Bishop, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, comrade, for this elaborate uh, introduction, which uh, I'm not used to. All I know, I just like to be uh, called by name and let, let go. But let, let's go back to the subject of today. The a lecture in honor of the Son of Man the Reverend Father Stanley Ndwasa, who was a priest um, in the Anglican Church uh, in, in Southern Africa till his uh, passing. I want to begin by sharing my own experience uh, of Sabelo, the son of man, that um, he was, as he was fondly known, uh, if you look at Matthew uh, 20, verses 20 to 28, um, Jesus explains that the Son of Man is the one who comes to serve others, but not to be served. 
And I think that defines who Stanley Prasa was, or who he understand uh, his uh, own gifts of serving uh, people. I personally first met him when he was at uh, pre-seminary as a student uh, at Umpumolo Theological Seminary in, in 1970. There were five of them visiting the local parish where I was an altar boy and a postulant. Four of them, uh, Messrs. Jeff Musalane, who also uh, became a priest as uh, since passed, Ananias Mpunzi, who ended up uh, working in, in, in England, um, and Drake, Kok, uh, Drake uh, uh, Tsekeng, uh, the only one really surviving. They came from the diocese of Kimberley and Kuruman in the Northern Cape. They were all very politically astute and adherent of black consciousness philosophy and believers in black theology, despite being in a seminary that taught Western theology. I want to assume that is where they began to question the way theology was being taught and the interpretation of the Bible. As a result, uh, the Son of Man deviated from the belief that God is all powerful and argued that this notion was nothing but a tool of the oppressor and insisted on painting the image of God as love and God as liberator. To many in black consciousness, Father Ntwasa was popularly known as the son of man. He did not suffer fools and was quick to use strong language to drive his point, even to the extent of threatening a fight. Not that he was violent, but that was an expression of his belief. Reading black theology, we may understand um, the son of man as having believed that God was a fighter in and through Christ. So the teachings of Jesus, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, meaning that one must turn the other cheek, was not acceptable to him because this would give the impression that God was passive and accepted false teachings to go by without challenge. He believed that humans had the freedom to defend themselves and to stake pride in their personal worth. I think I'm correct to conclude that their behavior, four of them, led to the closure of the seminary at Umpumolo, and they were then sent to Anglican colleges in Alice and Mtata to finish their studies. Born in Kimberley, there was no doubt that he was strongly influenced by Prof. Mangali Sosobukwe's teachings on Pan-Africanism, but but Stan felt that there was something missing, thus his baptism to black consciousness. So having been part of the university Christian movement, he was introduced to Steve Biko, with whom he became friends. And they shared their thoughts and beliefs on matters of politics and theology amidst the multiracial practices of artificial acceptance of equality under the apartheid framework, in which white value systems remained dominant. They both felt that there cannot be equality when they remain discriminated and segregated. They believe that God created all people in his image and gave them freedom to be fully human. 
Thus, the assertion between them that black, black theology was to give black people in South Africa a more humane face, since black consciousness taught that persons reject all value systems that seek to make them foreign in their own land and deprive them of their basic human dignity and value. Their thoughts and beliefs were complementary. They broke ranks with the students' multiracial movement to form South African student organization, SASO. Bigo accepted and believed the Christian gospel and agreed that black theology will help blacks to find God and Christ alongside them in their struggle to be fully human. God in Christ was the poor, the downtrodden, the wretched of the earth, of all whom defined who they are in God's purpose. So, while Bigo politically conscientized and mobilized blacks, the Son of Man powerfully preached black theology as a means and tool for liberation that sought to free the body, mind, and soul. They both encourage blacks to take pride in their culture, tradition, value, and to reclaim their own identity and to be proud of their blackness. Black is beautiful became the driving slogan. Black consciousness provided an important tool of leaving theology from the peculiarities of black people's experience. Therefore, the Old Testament stories recorded in the book of Exodus about Israelites' liberation from Egypt influenced Father Stan, Father Ntwasa's teaching and preaching. His God was the Exodus God, who was always taking sides with the poor and the oppressed, and fought with them against the evil forces of oppression and exploitation. Thus, Luke 4, 18 to 21, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim that the oppressed will be free, helped affirm the understanding that God was on the side of the oppressed, leading them to self-realization and fully human, loved by God. So that was Stanley's um, conviction. The gospel preached by the Son of Man was that God was God of justice and liberation. This was the interpretation of his argument and imagery of God as love and God as freedom. So Father Ntwasa was then the, the organizing secretary of the Black Theology, working with people like Basil Moore, with whom he collaborated in one of the first books that defined and promoted Black Theology, titled Black Theology, a South African voice. Their premise was that black theology starts with the black people in South Africa facing, facing the struggle against oppression, fear, hunger, insult, and dehumanization. This thinking would help understand and discover who these people are and why they were treated the way they were treated. Father Ntwasa believed, sorry, Father Ntwasa believingly preached that Christ was black, the truth only black theology would expound. So you can already deduct that black consciousness and black theology were developed at the same time along each other for the total liberation of black people. Father Ntwasa was truly a man of God. 
who devoted his life and ministry to proclaim the liberation of black people from the modern day pharaohs who use theology to justify their false teaching of apartheid, segregation and discrimination on the basis of race and one's pigmentation. He did this because he loved God and therefore loved black people. Thus, despite his education and training in Western institutions, Fadantwasa never forsook black people, but was always with them, living amongst them and working with and for them. As a result, his life was marked for suffering and death. He was a powerful speaker and a charismatic preacher of black theology and liberation of humankind. And of course, he was outspoken on political matters, unapologetically and publicly criticizing the regime and its system of dehumanizing black people. This led to Vadantwasa spending most of his life in and out of prison. Thank God they did not kill him as they did to his sole comrade, Steve. For those of you who visit the church now and then, would concur with me that Father Ntwasa's life was perfect reflection of the life modeled by Jesus Christ. He loved God, he loved black people, and believed that this love of God and of his people was stronger than death. So given life and death for black people, he would have chosen death. His teachings and sermons transformed many people who heard him and sought to live the gospel he preached. Father Sabelo's devotion to God reminded me of a character in a book I once read by Taylor Codwell titled Tender Victory. In the book, a doctor talks about priests and how disappointed he is that many were not living up to their calling. He then talks about his father, who was also a priest of a church that was called Church of the Good Shepherd. He says of his father that he was the last of the shepherds because his father tried to pound some honor in his congregation, some reverence, some hope, some idea of God, duty and love, and some guilt for all the sins people committed against one another and God every day. So that reflects to me the nature of the Son of Man, Father Stan. Thinking of Father Antwasa, he was also a good shepherd. He also tried to pound some honor in black people, whether it was on educational campuses, church parishes, or on the streets, wherever he talked and preached. He tried to pound not only the gospel, but the philosophy of blackness, self-respect and restoration of human dignity. A sense of reverence, of duty and love, of some affirmation of God's purpose in our creation. His mission was to help black people realize their oppression, that it was unjustifiable and to seek understanding as to why they were oppressed and exploited. I can conclude that he tried without success Otherwise, we would not have the type of clergy persons we have today. Prophet Bushiri is a typical type of Abifundis that the Sebarutis we have today. 
ones who see their calling to humanity as self enrichment ones who see their calling to the ministry of service as just another job or profession for self promotion or means towards getting rich quickly they have no sense of god as love and god as liberator thus they feed on the very flock they vowed to shepherd despite the biblical teachings that says to the priest don't load it over the people assigned to your care but lead them by your own good example that's what we find in the bible and that's what stanley was committed to thus he, he was called the son of man because he came to serve not to be served they do the opposite by making people carry them as their cross not the cross of salvation the bushiris type become idols worshiped by the very people whom they hypnotize to idolize them but antwasa would have named and chastised them or who and what they are i want to believe he must be turning in his grave today remember i said he did not suffer fools no had regard for authority for authority's sake in fact it is said of him that he reacted badly to authority even to church leadership So Father Antwasa believed beyond doubt that Jesus Christ who calls us tells us that our condition of service is really about self denial and of course if it were faith faithful if one was faithful and true to God then strangely instead of praise from people we shall be reviled persecuted and all kinds of evil and false teaching said about us by the very same people who are trying to help this is what happened to father stanley this is what went through in life but not once did he ever complain even the very church that formed and shaped his life never recognized him for the stand should have been a canon if not a bishop he died and was forgotten so we who know him and know his work are grateful that you in azapo who knew very little about him are gathered here today to honor the unsung hero the great teacher of theology and advocate of justice this was father andrasa's uh, mission to guide black people to god's love and to guide them to a living relationship founded in love for one another this is what really mattered in life of stanley not the reverse which we see in the lives of today's false prophets Unfortunately today the church and its clergy are caught up in vain pursuit materialism money and accumulation of wealth things that really do not matter in the long run clergy think that status matters more than the love of god and his creation they think that power matters and they will do anything to cling to it even if it destroys them and the very church Christ gave his life for for human salvation and we are deaf to that still voice echoing through the centuries whispering 
what does it profit a person if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? So we exact much energy in building our lives on the quicksands of futility and not on the rock of ages. Let me share with you, uh, comrades, something from Martin Luther King Jr., who a month before he was killed, preached a sermon titled The Drum Major Instinct. In the course of his sermon, he strangely talked about his death as it is written in his own, as if he was writing his own obituary. He said, and I quote that, when he died, he did not want a long funeral. And if they got someone to deliver the eulogy, not to talk too long. And that a person should not mention that he had a Nobel Peace Prize. No, he had three or 400 other awards. That was not important to him. But he wanted the person who mentioned to mention that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others, that he tried to love somebody, that he tried to feed the hungry, that he tried to clothe those who were naked, that he tried to visit those who were in prison that he tried to love and save humanity, and in short, that he tried to live a committed life to devoted to God's service. And this for me really gives us a picture of who Stan was and why he was called the son of man. The same could have been said about Father Dwasan. All of other shadows of shallow things that today we think are important, the status, the power, the wealth, the useless things, these things did not matter to him, but only the love of God and love of his people, love of black people in particular, to be freed. This is what he pounded in the minds of many who today have forgotten that he ever lived and taught them the truth about themselves. The Son of Man lived for God and service to humanity. This is what really mattered most to him that we love God and one another as black people and be of service to one another. You see, my dear comrades, no condition in the next life can buy for cash in this life or measured by any human scale of standards. The key to the next life only lies in the living relationship with God and each other. So we need to be continuously be falling in love with, with each other as black people. Therefore, in my own thinking, and God forgive me if I'm presumptuous, Father Stan, the son of man, tried to be faithful to the teachings of Christ and God knows that. Thus, I believe Jesus called Sabelo and Steve and said to them, and I quote, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom of God prepared for you from the creation of the world. For one, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. 
All this you found in the gospel that he believed in. Comrades, I want to leave you to think about the son of man's life, Satan Drasa, and many other comrades before us. But most importantly, to please, when we retire from this lecture, find the manifesto of the Azanian People's Organization, and uh, which was adopted in Haman Skral in 1983, and reread it and discuss it and talk about it not just among ourselves, but to many people who look up to Azapo as a liberation movement. So I thank you for the honor to deliver this lecture and for keeping our fallen heroes and heroines memory alive. So this must not be the first and the last, but a continuous program of education because whether we like it or not, the truth is there is a vacuum. The ruling party, the ANC has let us down. We are in a mess as a nation. We are leaderless and we need guidance and political education that makes black people respect, honor, love themselves rather than waiting to be told that they are hu humans and dependent on the ruling party. If we don't see or don't hear what people are saying about the, the status quo today, then we are also guilty as the ANC is for selling out the liberation that so many people died for. You see, people still talk about us as people who uh, fill the vacuum when they were in exile and not realizing that in actual fact, we were on the front line at that time. So let us go back and arm ourselves intellectually, physically, morally and spiritually to recapture the teachings of Steve, the teachings of Sabelo and leave their dream to be leaders in this country. And the honors is on you and on me. And so I thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Comrade uh, Bishop. Uh, you really made us to think, but uh, let me try and uh, allow one of your contemporaries uh, who was uh, a close friend of uh, the Son of Man uh, so that uh, he, he says something uh, to us. Uh, Drake thinking, uh, are you with us? Yes, at long last. Over to you, sir. Uh, what are your reflections uh, as a respondent? I didn't hear anything. It's only now that uh, you unmuted me. Oh my goodness. I didn't hear what, what, what the bishop said. That's a shame. Uh, okay, okay. We have been, we've been having some technical glitches, but I think uh, probably what we can do at the stage is to then say... Uh, you and uh, the son of man uh, come yes. from the same area uh, as a young as a young man growing up in Khaleshi with Kimberley. We looked up to you guys. I know the, the Mtwasa family in Khaleshi as well in the home. Uh, probably to just share with us and the viewers your reflections in terms of when you were growing up together 
schooling together, being at a seminary together, being doing ministry together, and also being in the black consciousness movement together. What are some of the highlights and issues that uh, stick out in your memory about uh, Ntate Father, uh, Reverend uh, Sabelo, Son of Man, Ntwasa? Ntwasa. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. Um, um, we grew up, as you said, with Stanley. We are from Kimberley together. We grew up uh, as young boys, attended the same church, same youth club. We had a place at a, at a church called uh, St. Um, Matthews, where we grew up actually as altar boys and then Sunday school teachers. And, uh, you know, we loved our, our, our parish church as boys. And um, although we went to different schools, because Stanley went to Roman, Roman Catholics in Bonaparte School, whilst I went to the Butler Road High School. But then uh, we, uh, our, of course, our fathers were very good friends. So we, we met we were meeting frequently with Stanley, were really, you know, close friends and the others like um, the late uh, Father Masilani, Jeffrey, mm. and uh, Amos Matthews, yes. Um, we left them, well, I left Kimberley, say about uh, 1964, went to a pre-seminary school, they call it testing school, at Murderport, the right reverend, I mean, the right reverend Bondo about Murderport. Um, we there for two years. Then from there went to a college called Mapumolo, which is a theological school for, for Lutheran priests mm -hmm. in Mapumolo, south of, uh, south of Durban next to Stengler. We were, we were with Stanley there. It was, a, it was actually five of us from Kimberley um, reading for our matric. We were there for three years. And after, and it, it's the time actually when the Black Consciousness Movement started around the time, because we're in Mapomolo from 66, to I think 69, yes. And it's the time also when we met with Steve Biko and the others, Ubani and uh, you know. Um, but uh, we, you know, we're, we're a close knit sort of boys. We're five boys from Kimberley, close knit. And uh, Stanley and another chap who's now late Ananias on Donam Punzi were sent by the Diocese of Kimberley to Mapomolo, while three of us, myself and uh, Musalani and Matthews, were sent by uh, the Diocese of Johannesburg. So after Mapomolo, we went to the seminary, and it is there again that we grew uh, politically, actively and so forth, and consciously. And uh, it is Sima Pomolo where we had to, I mean, we had a lot of black consciousness people visiting from uh, Durban. We had, um, I mean, Steve, the Mabandlas. We had um, people like uh, Moloto, Justice Moloto now, who's the judge, who was mm -hmm. with the uh, UCM at the moment, we were as a seminary affiliated to both UCM, University Christian Movement, and NUSAS. And uh, it was, um, you know, the time when I think it was in 1970 that we disaffiliated as a student body from uh, NUSAS. And, uh, you know, Supported, I mean, myself and Stanley were very, very, very strong 
of course, it was people at the time. But the old seminary followed us. And um, Stanley was a very careful person, was very voiceless, eloquent, and uh, very radical in a sense, not only in, in, in uh, politics, but even theologically. It was the time of black consciousness, I mean, black theology, the formation of black theology. And Stanley was a ardent supporter of the philosophy of black theology. And in the seminary, of course, as federal seminary, as we had other denominations like uh, the Methodist, Presbyterians, and um, um, what we call them now, United, yeah, UCSA, United Christian, United, uh, what you call it, UCCSA, yeah. Hmm. Uh, so we are quite a strong student body also. At the, at the time also, I mean, as I said, we had a lot of visitors from Wentworth. And also, I mean, I, I had a time to, as, as our president at the time, to be in the executive committee of SASU. So there was a frequent um, um, movement between us. So we had uh, people also coming when people like Tim Bassono at the time who was the president of SASU. We had uh, the late uh, Dr. Mashalaba. Mm. Yeah, no, Voyo Mashalaba. And um, as I said, uh, Justice Mabandla, quite a number of people came because it was the time also that uh, they were trying to recruit Fort A, because Fort A at the time was still affiliated to Sasu. And uh, the, chance, the vice chancellor of Fort A was very conservative, a chap called Devet at the time. But uh, in 19, I think it was in 1971, um, when Stanley was called upon to head the Black Theology Project. Mm. So Stanley had a um, seminar to be in Joburg for a year. And it was during that time, him and uh, James, what um, can I remember? I think uh, James Moore or something like that. Hey, yeah. Sir, hey, sir. Aaron. Yes, um, who were uh, busy preparing a book on black theology. Unfortunately, Stanley was supposed to, so he was actually going to edit that book. But unfortunately, it was um, when he was banned in 72, the book on 12 was um, edited by the chap who followed him, that is uh, Mokreti Mutabi, or George, in the name. But uh, Stanley, as you know, was uh, bent to Kimberley, and um, he continued. He was very stubborn. He didn't, I mean, there was no fear in Stanley, for the police or what. Even when he was, he was uh, restricted six to six, Sandley didn't care to come back home after six and no one could tell him anything. So he was, he was really stubborn. You know? And uh, it was also during that time when uh, uh, Jerry Mudisano was banned, was also a of president. And the two of them were banned, but uh, sometimes you'll find the two of them shouting at each other in public, the way, you know, Stanley was. But um, he had a good heart, Stanley. He was a very kind person. He loved his people and um, he loved the church. And, um, you know, he continued his ministry after in Kimberley. He was ordained, I think, uh, uh, Eldred Stubbs, who was a principal at the seminar, convinced the bishop to ordain Stanley because the bishop. At the time, Chadwick was reluctant 
and ordaining Stanley. But uh, Stanley was ordained and he continued his ministry in Kimberley. Um, you know, and of course, we are apart. I used to visit Kimberley just on when I'm on holiday to meet up with Stanley. And he used to visit me in, uh, in Johannesburg and so forth. And uh, he never changed. Stanley was the same. When in Johannesburg, Stanley, um, you know, he, he, he acted as if Soweto was a peaceful place. He could walk at night, anytime at night. That was Stanley for, for you. If he had nothing, he was, nothing should scare, scare him. He, of course, no, I mean, we know that he suffered torture in, in prison because he was now and again in prison, charged for that and that, breaking his uh, burning orders. And, um, you know, and Stanley, but remained Stanley. And that's the man I want to remember. He was the chap who was, uh, you know, he did, he did not, um, or, or what you call, entertain fools, in a sense. But, okay. uh, mm -hmm. yes, if it's wrong, if you are wrong, Stanley was bold enough to tell you in your, in your, in your face, whether you get angry or not, he didn't care. Okay, but he, he, he said it, he said it, he said it as it is in that moment. He said it as it is, yes. He, yes. Was, he, was, he might even swear at you, but, okay. but that okay. was... Uh, okay, Dr. Murut, you know what, I just wanted us to, to zoom into one or two issues while you are still there, and I'll also bring in, bring in the bishop, I've got uh, also some, 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 some reaction from our, from our viewers. But just to say, there is this, there is this nickname of, uh, of, of Father Sello, Sisabe uh, Lomtoasa, uh, called the Son of Man. Yes. Uh, can you just briefly in a minute or two? Share with us uh, what uh, what is the genesis and the history of that name? <laughs> yes, yes. Stanley, of course, he he called himself the son of man. I mean, we, yeah. it's a biblical of name, which uh, actually it's about the Messiah, a redeemer. Or, mm -hmm. But it is that it's for him, son of man meant, um, you know, someone who is dedicated to humanity. Okay. And that went from stand. Because, we, you know, even biblically, the Son of Man was the person who liberated us from whatever oppression, oppression we are in. Okay. Okay. I want to read that, um, you know, nickname of Saint to mean Son of Man. The one who is prepared to suffer, one who's not even afraid to give his life for the sake of others. Okay, okay. Mutate Bishop, Dr. Bishop, help us here. What we are seeing and what we have heard makes us to wonder where did we go wrong as a country? Why is it that in the church today, we don't have sons of men who are dedicated and committed to serve and not to be served? Those who are selfless and who give themselves to the advancement of humanity. Where did we go wrong? That would be the first question. The second statement that I would want you to respond to is, now that black theology was meant to do all these things that you talked about, to raise consciousness, to make sure that we are closer to the people, to bring back the humaneness of mankind, for us to care, like in the book, in the book of Galatians chapter six, it says, do good to all especially to those in the household of faith. 
But we don't see that happening today. The question is, why is black theology not being taught? Why did black theology lose impact and influence? What has happened? Ntate Murti Tsengkeng and the Bishop, uh, what has happened? And uh, let the Bishop answer first, yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Drake, and um, for your uh, input. Look, um, Black theology is being taught in, in, in seminaries and universities as we speak. The problem that we have is that people, especially the younger clergy, are more into power games and accumulation of uh, material things. They have no consciousness of serving. You see the, the, the um, notion of um, son of man, biblically speaking, is about the one who come to serve, not to be served. And as I said, that's what we saw in Stanley's life. And uh, as a consequence of his commitment to um, liberating uh, people psychologically and spiritually, of course, he, he paid the price. Um, instead of being praised, he was crucified. But the real uh, uh, problem that we have today, um, you know, as a bishop, is that there are fewer and fewer young people who go to university and theological colleges to learn theology. They now correspond and um, most of them are self-supporting, so they look after parishes while they are uh, earning or aspiring for money. So the younger people who have been to um, seminaries, they think, look, these guys are driving big cars, living in big houses, and so why not? And then the prosperity gospel that comes from the US, the Bushiri type uh, kind of clergy, um, are not helpful because they are loading over the people instead of serving people. And yet scripture is very clear, don't load over the people assigned to you, care for them, um, lead by a, a example uh, passed uh, on to us by Christ. So that, that's where the problem really is. It's about uh, power, uh, materialism, uh, wealth, and um, uh, church has become uh, um, what you call um, a means of enrichment. You know, quick um, to say, you know, I'm a prophet, I'm a bishop, um, uh, all these kinds of things that really don't mean much uh, based on what people possess and being idealized. Um, as I said, I mean, they get hypnotized by these prophets, these bishops, these pastors. Um, and, and, and as I said, you know, Stanley would have um, um, named and shamed them of who they are. Uh, because they were, a, they are a disgrace, even as we speak, not only to a uh, black nation, but to um, the church which they serve. You know, so that's my my own thing where the problem is really. Okay. And of course, you know, uh, Drake, you 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 you, you in, in practice, uh, the congregants, uh, the parishioners are not really calling clergy to account. And, and so clergy think that they can do as they please and get away with it. And they have, unfortunately. Um, unlike you and uh, uh, Drake and myself from the old school, uh, most of our clergy really work on Sunday morning for two hours and that's over. 
you try to meet with them during the week, uh, they have no time except being sacramental to say the Eucharist because that's what is required to do the liturgy. But service to God and his people is no longer there. Okay. So this... Thank you for the compliment what I'm saying. Thinking? Yes, I, I think I agree in total with, with the bishop. Um, that's the situation. I think also that perhaps just to add that uh, the unfortunate thing is that our clergy nowadays don't read. Mm. They are so lazy. They don't read. That's why they don't understand any other concept. Secondly, is that, um, you know, during the old regime, we're united against an enemy that we all knew. But since democracy dawned in this country, I mean, even the church has become confused. We, we don't know where we stand sometimes. We find, as the bishop said, the like clergy now, clergy now has become too materialistic. All what they think of is getting money and getting rich, um, living in, I mean, getting lovely cars, posh cars and so forth. And then, okay. you know, they, that's uh, the thing that um, we as the church today are not being prophetic as we used to be. Simply that uh, we have lost our way. Perhaps democracy has confused us. We have become, what I would say, embedded within the system. What is happening here is that uh, the clergy, of course, now we can become chaplains of police, chaplains of army, chaplains of that and that. And in a way, if I am a civil servant, of course, that will make me mute also. And that's mm. a problem. We want to be people who don't want to hurt anybody, respected of whether the situation is deteriorating. But the church, you know, remains a church that it doesn't know where it stands sometimes at the moment. Okay. Okay. No, 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 we have we have heard you in Tate, in Tate thinking and Bishop. Uh, there is but this. let me just say that, uh, comrade, you know, w one of the things that um, is really problematic, as I, as I said earlier, is that parishioners are not challenging the clergy. Parishioners are not questioning some of the things clergy teach. I mean, I can tell you how painful it has been for me, even as a bishop, if I showed up at the parish without giving notice, because the priest just had no sermon. It would seem to me they think as they enter the, the church or going up to the pulpit, and you could see it, the message is not coordinated. There's no substance. It doesn't mean anything intellectually and spiritually. Thus, our people, and I can speak of my own church, the Alcan Church, will come to Mass in the morning. In the afternoon, they go to the Bushiris Church. Mm. Why is that? You know, they, they're schizophrenic in their behavior. They are searching for something they are not getting from the established church. And until such time that people can challenge the clergy to take responsibility, to question the sermon preached, to question the message, to, I, I used to say as a dozen bishop, you know, 
it's okay for you to preach, but try and teach at least in one of your sermons, teach something, let people take something home to think and to try and practice. Because our th black theory is really about praxis, mm, mm. not a theory. And so if you try, you, you can't use a sermon as an opium. You need to make people realize their peculiarities, the conditions in which they live, and to ask why what is happening to us is happening. So that, that's what I think. And I think, uh, you know, in black consciousness, one of the things that we believed in is to work among people on community projects. Community projects were very key in the life of uh, black consciousness. That is no longer happening. We've been uh, infiltrated by West who give us money and dictate to us the kind of projects that we must run, which have nothing about empowering and building communities as we used to do. A bishop will hear you, but now someone will say, as the church not stagnated in the past, that as politics moved, like in this country in particular from apartheid into a sort of, for lack of a better expression, a, a bourgeois democracy, that the church, particularly the traditional churches, did not move with the times. And also black consciousness, one might argue that if indeed black consciousness was meant to infuse self-reliance, why does it appear that even in the church, it doesn't find resonance with the masses of our people? Why does it appear that the traditional churches are not attractive, but the so-called charismatic movement that preaches or at the same time is a prosperity gospel resonates with our people? Isn't it perhaps that maybe the message that they preach resonates with the milieu that we are in today because people are out there, they want to improve their lives and they sell this message to them. They sell this narrative to them. And also a, a bishop in Tatemurti thinking, people might argue that there is this scripture that says, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. People will say we, we don't want to move in the streets of gold when in the afterlife, we want to do that now. Let it be on earth as it is in heaven. We want to see it now. And that's what the prosperity gospel seems to be promising people. What would the two of you say to that kind of, of thinking and argument? Yes, well, I think, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, black theology was exactly saying the same thing, although not in the sense of the prosperity gospel churches, but black theology was saying that people uh, should be liberated now, hmm. not in the afterlife. And as the bishop said, because uh, we find that um, our clergy at the, at the moment are uh, preaching what we call a pie in the sky gospel. Mm. They are perhaps competing or trying to compete with uh, prosperity churches. They say what people want to hear because truly people flock to these churches because all what they are after is to see miracles happening in their lives. Mm. That is, you mm. know, solving their financial problems, solving their marriage problems, solving their life problems and so forth. And people are attracted towards these false prophets. And unfortunately, um, in our churches, the traditional, I mean, 
uh, traditionally historical churches. Our priests, as I said it, they don't read. That's why their sermons are flat. You know, their sermons have nothing, nothing to offer at all to people. And as is true, what the bishop said, that some of them actually think about what to say next when they are up in the altar, on the, in the, on the pulpit. So what do we expect? But um, perhaps our masses are also under the impression, I mean, people want to be successful in life. And, um, you know, we have to gain poverty, a massive poverty in, in, our, in our country. And a message being preached is that, uh, you know, a certain party is the reason why people are getting pensions. And uh, people tend to believe that kind of thing. Mm. And we know that people want to be successful, they want to be able to love and eat. That's why when we come with the message of self-assertion of people, people to become who they meant to be, it's difficult. Black consciousness doesn't mean that uh, it is not alive, it is very much alive. And uh, perhaps we need to try harder than we do at the moment. Just like in the churches, people need to be told that uh, they can have their heaven now as liberated people. People who have a relationship with God, who love them. And uh, in that way, people will begin to see that I am loved by God, so I am somebody. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the thing we have to need. And uh, in black consciousness can, I mean, it's not only a message by black theology, but uh, black consciousness also can begin to, we could begin to emphasize amongst our people that, uh, you know, they have accepted themselves as poor, well, which is not meant to be. Mm. And make it plain to them what poverty means, because poverty is not a blessing, but a curse. And it is not a blessing from God that you, you or it's not a curse from God that you become poor, but it is because of man, irresponsibility, man's exploitations, man's greed, that people are poor. And if people can, our masses of people can begin to understand that and begin to open their eyes to the real situations by beginning to believe in themselves that they matter, whatever their situation is. That's what we get. Okay. Okay, Dr. Bishop? But look, I, I, I think that uh, what uh, Father Drake has said um, is true and it reflects the situation in our uh, congregations. Um, the traditional parish has uh, abundant teaching and to some degree they try to compete with the Bushiri type churches hmm. who hypnotize people and make people believe on what does not exist. And I think black consciousness and black theology was really and continues to say to people, they must reclaim their tradition, their customs, their value systems, and be proud of who they are and what they are becoming even in, at this age. Now, that can only happen if, if we continue to sit around the fire together and talk about our past, our presence, and plan the future. You see, people like Stan, for instance, mm. who gave so much to the church, mm. 
we are not questioning as to why the church has no recollection of their lively of their lives when i was a bishop i i was one of those who were pushing for for instance um steve beagle to be um added in the calendar of the mitres mm. uh, not one diocese both kimberley and johannesburg where stanley served has ever talked about giving a posthumous posthumous canonship Mm. They couldn't honor him when he was alive. They can't honor him today when he's, he's no longer there. Yet they know his contribution of building the black nation and building the faith and educating people with theology that was biblically based, but with less um western influence you know um one of my concerns is that we're not learning from the past mm. we rush to learn up on the future mm. if we don't understand because we have not actually dealt with the issues that we raised and brought us to where we are today and so, you know, the churches have become just another social club, really. Mm. In fact, Stockfells and Masngobane things are more popular than churches. If the Masngobane or Stockfell is meeting on a Sunday, the church is empty. Mm. And clergy has never asked why are people electing to go to Masngobane when he is going to be presiding at the death of that person. Mm, mm. But those are issues that we need to be uh, uh, dealing with. No, no, you know, no. Drake, you know, one of the things, uh, uh, Father Drake, one of the uh, things I, I, I was um, um, disappointed at, you know, the Anglican Church uh, celebrates 150 years this year. Yes. I won't believe it. And I did send a WhatsApp message to some people. The Archbishop of Cape Town, who is black and young, invites an Archbishop of Canterbury to celebrate 150 years of the Anglican Church in Africa. When we have such credible theologians, faith people, historians, who can tell us where, from the colonial age, to where it is today has been happening to the church. It was disgraceful. And people never questioned those who are still in office. I'm retired now and nobody uh, listens to, to me. No, but, but, I can... did send, but I did send a WhatsApp message which says this is disgraceful to the yes. black people in this country that our 150 years of uh, being in this continent is celebrated by a white liberal from England. From England, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So what is a young yeah. priest thinking? He still thinks that the church in England, he is actually a, a servant of the church in England. It's not true. Oh. We yeah. are a black yeah. church in the, uh, in the continent in South, South Africa. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. it's true. Yeah. Bishop and Father, and, 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 and further thinking. Uh, just what you have just said, just to let you know what you have just said, Bishop, maybe just this in passing. Uh, maybe the church should start listening to you. Uh, look, we in academia, and I see you've got that as well. Uh, once our professors retire um, and associate professors, we give them a status of emeritus. So you should be emeritus, Bishop. And then well, the no, they, they, they tried to make me that I opposed it. I oppose it because it doesn't has no meaning. Okay, okay, okay. No, that's you fine. Know, we, will, we, will talk, we, will, we will talk about that offline. I was just I was just trying to tease your brain. Uh, 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 Bishop and Father Tsingi, uh, one might say, like as you are lamenting now, uh, uh, Bishop, uh, to say, uh, uh, Father Sabelo should be 
turning in his grave of what is happening, particularly in the church. Now, don't we think that what we've got now is a product of what, for lack of a better term, I, I call religious inertia, right? That we are experiencing all this. I'm speaking about religion, this concept, religious inertia, I'm using it guardedly, to then say, isn't it because the church, particularly the traditional church and the prosperity gospel are not preaching the message from the word and they therefore cannot emulate congregations that are questioning. For instance, Bishop, you say, the parishioners don't question. Now, there is this church in the Bible called the Berrian Church. When Paul goes to preach to them, they will go and reflect on the preachings to then check whatever Paul said, is it scriptural? Is it in the scripture? And then they will engage with the apostle. But now in current times, we don't find that. Is the problem also not with the seminaries that we have? Is the problem not with the theology that we teach? Is the problem also not that the church has tended to conform as opposed to becoming a voice of truth and reason? As a result, it has become part of this political fiber that takes us nowhere. Don't we think that the problem that we are in now is doesn't lie in our stars, but it lies in us as those who are in the leadership of the church, that we've got congregants and parishioners who don't emulate the Berrian church. What would you say to that Father Tsengkeng and, and Bishop uh, Sioka? Yes, you're, you're, you're quite right. Uh, I mean, Bishop Sioka said, uh, our congregants are not questioning anything that priest says. Perhaps we, unfortunately, we are now retired, so our voices don't matter anymore in the church. But, um, you know, we go back in history and look at how liberation theology prospered in Latin America, because it was not a concept that was devised in universities, colleges, but it was a theology that came from the people. It was a theology that was sort of based community, sort of based clergy group discussions with ordinary people, looking at a biblical text, taking that biblical text and seeing their own situation through that text, whether it's um, lack of land or so forth. But uh, there was a base community project. So it was a theology that grew up from the roots, not up, 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 down, but down, up. Perhaps, you know, we need to relearn from things like the emergence of liberation theology okay. as a theology that was based in communities and a theology that does involve in communities, communities that uh, discussed biblical text, which were relevant or even spoke to their own life situations. Yeah. Okay. You sure? I mean, you, you're right, you know, uh, during Paul's time, even in Jesus's time, People, that's why we had such huge uh, arguments when people felt there was something that was not um, true, they challenged it. Mm. And they wanted to know why Paul said this and not that. What was the meaning of what he said in the context in which they uh, live their lives? And as I said earlier on, uh, in black consciousness, we were very strong in community work. Mm. Um, the communities that Drake is, is, is referring to, um, which in, informed our theology. Seminary education was never enough. Mm. It was what you learned on the ground. What is it that influenced people? What made us as black people poor because we're oppressed 
mm. were exploited and we were um, brainwashed to believing that it was okay. And when we began to challenge, look, I was a, I was a bishop uh, in Pretoria, a, a black bishop, first black bishop in that apartheid uh, seat. Mm. I was never pop popular with uh, white people. In fact, it is said when I left, pe white people said, we don't want another Sioka. Whoa. Because I challenged them. Mm. I used mm. to, and I remember one guy, a white guy came, had come from England and uh, he tried to correct me uh, on, on something and questioning things. And I said to him, look, my friend, I am 10 times educated than you are. You came from England here being nobody and we made you a priest. Mm. You have no experience of people. Mm. You have never lived in a ghetto. Mm. Um, you have never even worked in a black uh, parish. And so you can't really tell me. But people believed and looked up to white priests as the messiahs. When, when, when you know, I worked in Soweto, you'll know that, uh, uh, Father Drake, people will tell you about when the CRs were here, we didn't do the following. Mm. When they had been very good priests after the CR fathers were there, but they were never mentioned or commended or quoted as having contributed towards the welfare uh, of and development of the black people. And we failed them because we never said, tell me exactly what did Father uh, so and so did, except that he built the church uh, with the money that he got from uh, overseas. But in terms of mental liberation and spiritual development, nothing really happened. And, and, and so our young clergy actually don't even understand that history. Mm. Mm. Because they don't have, as, 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 as Father Drake was saying, they are not, if, if, if they educate, educate people, they fear, they'll be asked questions that they cannot answer because their reading capacity is limited. As I said, most of them are self-supporting. Mm. There are people who have never been to college, university, who have become very important leaders in our church. When you engage with them, they have nothing to offer. Mm, mm. So it becomes uh, acceptable. Okay. Okay. And we're not no, challenging, no. Uh, challenging that. No, I hear you. No, I'm, not, I'm not challenging. And of course, it also reflects in the kind of bishops that are elected nowadays. Because, uh, you know, exactly. Not to be desired. Exactly. So, exactly. Uh, we, we have had in our church mm. guys becoming bishops because they were favored by white bishops at the time. And these guys yes. had never been to a seminary. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but, yes. but, 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 but just the a, a, a bishop and, and, and Father Tsinking, I uh, want us to, 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 to go back as, as we are going towards closure now, seven or so minutes that we are left with, to then say, exactly that, the issue of why it seemed the church has deteriorated in the new movement, the charismatic movement. People will say, but I had the calling from God and I'm directed by the Holy Spirit. So I don't need seminary because the Holy Spirit is the comforter that Jesus left for us. And I'm what I'm doing now to start this ministry is in response to the calling of the Holy Spirit, right? And uh, I then therefore don't need any mini uh, seminary to go to because uh, the Holy Spirit will reveal to me the truth so that I'm able to preach the gospel as per the revelation from the Holy Spirit. What do you think, uh, Bishop and uh, Father Thinking, what do you think uh, Reverend uh, Sabelo Ntwasa would have reacted like to this kind of understanding of, of, of what happens in the church. 
he would have chastised them. He would have put them in their place. He would have um, been very bold uh, to, to say it as is. Look, uh, Father Drake will tell you, um, Stanley didn't have respect for bishops who were um, uh, white and thinking they knew it all. He, he put them in their places and thus they tried. Look, one, Stanley was not only destroyed by the apartheid political system, he was destroyed by his own church. Okay. Yeah. Stanley yeah. was destroyed by his own church, the Anglican church. I can yes. tell you black bishops who contributed towards the downfall of Stanley. Yes, it's true. Hmm. When I was, I can tell you now, one of the most respected church leaders in our country who wrote to me and said, stop working with the trade union. Stop supporting the workers. And what? I'm telling you, I can give you the name. Okay, okay. Let, 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 and let, that's what they were doing to Stanley because he had no support system. Okay. I became yes. a bishop by default, let me tell you that. Because I was very adamant that white people are not going to get on my way. Mm. And I had to, 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 to be so assertive, so engaging, so... Um, I didn't even care what I said in their presence, almost like Stanley would have been done. Okay. And you know, they have a tendency, if, you, if they see you, you have, you've got strong mind, strong um, um, issues, and you're, you're, you're not afraid, you have the courage, and you're bold to confront them, mm. to, let, to let you go. And so I was fortunate at the time, because then I also realized that I, I need to build the people in the Diocese before I became a priest. So before I became, uh, sorry, I became a bishop, people knew already that I had leadership potentials. But okay. when I left, I was replaced by a non-starter, to be honest with you. So you tried, you tried, you tried to inculcate the mentality of the Berean church, right? Exactly. People to be self-reliant, but then when you left, they all left. Exactly. Uh, 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 but I think that, yeah, that's what uh, that's what Paul, Paul's trying to say. You know, statehood also, I would think the same about uh, people who say that, uh, to answer your question, I have the spirit so I can, I can preach. People mm -hmm. fail to think that, uh, you know, there is uh, a saying that many are called, but few are chosen. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the spirit... If you are called, you need to be under a certain direction because, uh, <laughs> you know, the spirit doesn't uh, say every Tom, Dick, and Mary <laughs> can start preaching the gospel. <laughs> but the spirit perhaps calls, but you need guidance. You need mm -hmm. guidance. That's why there is a need for training, to train mm -hmm. you. You cannot just have anybody coming there and say that preach. That's why I think now. Yeah. That's that why, is why that's they don't even read Luke 4, verse 18 continuously. That okay. the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim the good news. Amen. Exactly. Amen. Yes. To let the captives free. Yeah. Yeah. That is why yes. they don't go to prison to visit the prisoners. They don't have yeah. To go and visit the, and empathize with the sick. Yes. They don't, yeah. you know, no, they don't. It's all about self enrichment. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go to an Anglican church today and try to cleanse the sermon, and the, a priest will talk about tithing because he oh. wants money and yes. says nothing about the gospel. Exactly. Exactly. But, 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 but Bishop, when they say that, uh, when you speak about tithing, Father, as well, the tithing is meant uh, to take care of the widows, to take care of the Levites. 
those that serve the law. But they don't, you see, if they did that, it would be a different story. Yeah, yeah we don't, yeah. the tithing thing in the church that we're doing, if they don't take care of what is supposed to, 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 to happen. As we read the, what okay. you call, uh, the, what you call widows were taken care of from yeah. donations by the churches. Yes, yes. They, yeah. Yeah. You, you can continue. Yeah, I mean, I, I, they just after money. They okay. all what is about money, money, money. There is okay. no spiritual building up or development in our churches. Oh, okay, okay. I, I think now with time, I think the, I think probably going forward, Azako, when on this political online series, when we host a preachers, I think we should actually have an hour extra, because That's with true. preachers you end up. I mean, as facilitator, I've been trying to drive the issue, but then we, as, as we march, as we march, as we talk, so do things come up. So. I think we we have come to 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 the end of, of, of our of our discussion. There is still much to talk about, but what I just wanted us to do in closing to just give each one of you a minute each, but in particular, Bishop Sioka, I would want you to to just take us back because you talked about Reverend uh, Ndwasa, and uh, you talked about his passion, selfless selflessness. A father Satan came to tell us what this nickname, the son of man, means. You also talked about the Azapo Manifesto. And you implored us, members of Azapo, you implored members, uh, the viewers who are listening to go to the Azapo website and uh, download and read that manifesto. Why is it important that we should read that manifesto in relation? to, as we memorialize uh, Reverend Ntwasa and uh, his ideas, his beliefs, and also as a proponent of black theology. Look, um, as far as I'm concerned, I think that um, reading empowers one. Knowledge is power. And um, reading will help us to develop our mental capacity to think, to be critical thinkers, to be able to transfer the knowledge to the next generation so that people know where we have come to be where we are and to begin to analyze the future so that the memory of our leaders is kept alive. That's why I'm so grateful for this lecture personally, because it actually helped us to admire and to appreciate what people like Stanley and Biko did because their teachings have shaped us. Yeah. And uh, black consciousness has attributes of um, intelligence. Uh, they have uh, the attributes of um, courage, uh, leadership, uh, uh, to be decisive in whatever they do. Mm. You know, to be a leader, you must be able to make a decision, whether it is wrong or right, but you must make a decision. And I used to say to clergy, make a decision, we'll correct it as we go along if it is wrong. But you cannot just sit back and say, well, I didn't know what to do. And reading will help us. I think Father Drake is absolutely right. He's correct that we must encourage reading. Mm. <clears throat> and today it's so easy because the material is all over the place. You know, you just go, you, there's a guy called Mr. Google. You have an answer. He's got it. You, you have a question. He's got an answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you know? 
Yeah. Yeah. For, for, for the thinking. Yes, my last words will be that, uh, you know, I always think about perseverance. That um, as a Zapo, we should persevere in what we believe. And I'm thinking back of the time of the early time of uh, black consciousness, because the objective of the movement was to unify the people, the oppressed people of God in South Africa. And I also remember that uh, Steve, when he died, he was from uh, Cape Town, mm -hmm. where he was actually pursuing unity of black movements. Now, I know there have been black consciousness uh, organization meeting trying to unify. But I'm saying to you people, don't lose hope. I think it's important that we unify and speak with a united voice, a united black consciousness voice, not sections there, sections there. That is killing okay. and it confuses our people. Okay, okay. No, thank you very much. Uh, I think what I would want to say in closing is just to say that uh, this memorial lecture indeed, uh, Bishop and, uh, and Father Thinking and Bishop Sioka, it, 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 it basically takes us back to then say as a people, we should not forget. Yeah. That a people that don't know themselves, a people that don't have a memory of themselves, stand for nothing because they would then lose their identity. This reminds me as someone who also hails from Halishewe Kimberley, that uh, Reverend Ntwasa, when the police like he would defy the banning orders and so on. And uh, in one church, I think it was the St. James Church, the police came and they cornered him while he was addressing us as young Boy Scouts. And uh, when they said to him, you are talking politics, to the astonishment of all of us, he said, yes. In fact, my very existence is political. <laughs> he then said to the special branch police, do you understand what politics is? Politics is about people. And I'm yeah. here talking issues that relate to the needs of people. And I have people assembled here to talk about issues that relate to people. So I am indeed talking politics because I'm talking to people. And yeah. that stuck in my mind as a young man up until yes. today. What also stuck to me, one viewer is sharing with us, he says, when Reverend Ntwasa was administering the rites at the tombstone unveiling of the late Tamim Kweha, the then Azayo uh, uh, president, he sang his liturgy, which he says it could be him. And that goes as follows. Here lieth a man who had no guile. And that is Reverend Sabelo, son of man, Stanley Ntwasa. And we a lot say, of courage and boldness. <laughs> Amen. A man indeed of courage. And we want to say thank you very much to Azabo, but also thank you to Bishop. In our view, as Azabo, you are not retired, but you are you are a working uh, source of wisdom that from time to time we need to tap from. Father Thinking knows that that uh, we would tap on his intelligence from time to time. He will also remember that in one of the platforms, he talked, when they talked about the busy moments in the various areas, and he shared to the nation and to the world and to the Azapo comrades about the black consciousness moments in the Northern Cape, particularly specifically in Halishiwi Kimberley. So on behalf of Azapo and uh, the online political education series of Azapo, I would like to thank you and also thank Azapo and thank also the, the family of the Ntwasa family. Now, before we, 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 we say our goodbyes and close, just want to remind the viewers that tomorrow 
at one o'clock, we will be hosting Dr. Mtolisi Nochulwana, who will be speaking on the topic African Continental Free Trade Agreement and its implications on South Africa's economy. So we indeed, uh, uh, Bishop and Father, take, take to heart what you said. Educate, educate, read, and read. The Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So as Azaku, we want to educate, to liberate, and we will invite all these speakers. And also we've got what we call a generation, a, an intergenerational mix in terms of sharing with skills. Mm -hmm. So that was all from me. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I would just like to say it was a great pleasure uh, having had this particular session and uh, having you, uh, Father, and having you as well, Bishop. Uh, thank you very much. That's thank you. it uh, from, from me. Yeah, please send a, a link for tomorrow's um, session. Listen, yeah. We will send Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Listen, the struggle was not red. I experienced it. Being deprived, being oppressed, being confused. It's enough now. We're taking the power back. We're stronger than before. We're proud, proud, and too strong. The worst is over. From K to Cairo, I'm Morocco to Madagascar. From K. Uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for your leadership. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop.